Hello and welcome to uh, lecture five. This is the final lecture of our uh, mini course on the dynamics of circle mappings. Um, today, in this first part of the lecture, this is part one, uh, I want to uh, just give you an overview of uh, the holomorphic methods that are employed in the study of critical circle maps. Okay, so uh, I will very briefly present you uh, some uh, overview of Solvent's program for the study of renormalization, originally for unimodal maps, but his program can be adapted to the case of the circle. Um, I will introduce the notion of holomorphic commuting pair, which is an object that plays the same role as quadratic like maps pre uh, present in, 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 in Solvent's uh, 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 theory. And then I will. Uh, tell you a little bit about how you get exponential convergence of renormalizations, which, as we saw in previous lectures, uh, is something that is, you know, implies uh, the smooth rigidity that we are uh, seeking for these, for these maps. And here the tools become very interesting. There's uh, something which is at the root of exponential convergence, which is uh, um, a theorem due to Kurt McMullen, which is his dynamic inflexibility theorem. And for that, I need to tell you uh, what uh, D points of a dynamical system are and what uniform twisting means. And this will be really an overview with no details, okay? Even less details as uh, in previous lectures where we, you know, we had to make some choices and we had to be very, um, you know, very skimpy on details. But here is really... Uh, you know, the situation is even uh, uh, more dramatic in the sense that there is a lot less uh, time to, to, to tell you about these things. In particular, we are not going to talk about uh, hyperbolicity of renormalization, okay? The, the, the fact that the so-called renormalization operator is a hyperbolic operator on, certain, on a certain space. Uh, for uh, unimodal maps, uh, in this, uh, in this goal of proving hyperbolicity, there are some deep theorems due to uh, Liubich and, and Avila, uh, both by themselves and in combination with one another, you know, in collaboration with one another. Um, still in the context of unimodal maps, uh, hyperbolicity uh, was established for CR unimodals by uh, well, Wellington Di Mello, Alberto Pinto, and myself, um, using the analytic, you know, the, the fact that in the analytic world, you have hyperbolicity. So you're able to sort of push the hyperbolicity from the uh, analytic world to the uh, CR world, okay? And uh, for critical circle maps, the hyperbolicity of renormalization was established by Ian Polsky. Like I said, I'm not going to talk about this hyperbolicity, so you don't even need to, to know what I mean here. What, what really matters to us here in this lecture is try to give you an idea of how to, how to get exponential conversions of the renormalizations. You know, you, you have two critical circle maps, and you know that they are conjugate, they have the same topology, there is a conjugacy sending critical point to critical point, and you want to show that uh, this conjugacy is uh, C1 smooth or C1 plus alpha smooth or something like that. And as we saw in previous lectures, if we know that the renormalizations of these two maps, the successive renormalizations converge together exponentially fast in a certain, in a certain sense, either in C0 sense or C, C1 or C2 sense, then you can deduce something about the conjugacy. You, you deduce that the conjugacy say C1, okay? That's the general idea. So, so the issue here is to, uh, how do you get um, exponential convergence of renormalizations? Okay. Um, so first of all, I'm only going to talk about maps with one uh, critical point, okay? The critical circle maps that we're going to consider here are unicritical circle maps, but I'm just going to refer to them as critical circle maps anyway. Uh, like I said, the smooth rigidity problem is something that uh, can be solved if you if you know that there is uh, a renormalization convergence with a, with an exponential rate, and uh, so this is a, a, an elaboration of what I just said. So I'm not going to repeat it. 
uh, you know, here I'm the only thing I'm going to comment about is that we uh, for this ansatz here we 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 require that the distance between the successive renormalizations goes goes to zero exponentially fast. But what distance is it that we're talking about? If it happens to be C2 distance, the distance in the C2 topology, then, then we can actually get that the conjugate C C1 for arbitrary uh, irrational rotation number. But uh, if you have just uh, exponential contraction in the C0 uh, sense, then uh, what you can do is you, you can still show that the conjugacy is going to have some regularity provided you restrict a little bit the rotation numbers. So if you, there is like a full measure set of rotation numbers uh, for which uh, this, this ansatz still holds. In other words, that this, this uh, C0 uh, exponential contraction implies uh, C1 conjugacy. In fact, this implies a little bit better. It implies C1 plus alpha conjugacy, okay? But that's just a, uh, technical uh, detail here just think of it in, in in this in these terms i mean what we really want is to show that the successive renormalizations converge together at an exponential rate in a suitable uh, topology which you you can think for now just the c0 topology okay uh unfortunately no one uh, knows uh, how to do this uh without using complex an analysis, without using complex analytic techniques, you know, things like um, quasi-conformal deformations of complex structures, hyperbolic geometry, and things like that. And uh, the idea of using these tools uh, was originally given by uh, Dennis Sullivan, okay? So he actually laid down a program for establishing uh, renormalization convergence, you know, at an exponential rate, he was not entirely su successful in the sense that he was not able to show that there was exponential contraction or exponential convergence of renormalizations, but he was able to prove that there was convergence without a rate. So his uh, recipe for getting the, to this uh, point is, first you, you, know, you look at your uh, real uh, uh, one-dimensional systems and you get some geometric bounds on the orbits of critical points. So these are the so-called real a priori bounds. And we have seen the real a priori bounds here in this course for the circle. We know that there are uh, a priori bounds. But uh, Sullivan's original uh, uh, context was unimodal maps. So he actually got a priori bounds, uh, meaning uh, on the post-critical set of these maps, which are, which are usually Cantor sets for, for the, the situations that matter for him, OK? Um, all right, so, and these these bounds, they actually, uh, uh, they're so robust that they actually imply that if you start, you know, with a map which is infinitely renormalizable and you start renormalizing, 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 then uh, you, you kind of go, even if you start with a map which is only, say, C3, you uh, converge exponentially fast to the family of analytic maps, okay? So, and the convergence can can be taken, you know, if, if the map is CR, you can take the conversions to be up to CR minus one, you know, in, in that topology. Okay. Um, so the second step in Sullivan's stra strategy is to, uh, uh, to use these a priori bounds to uh, promote the topological conjugacy that you have between two systems. So if you have two systems, two unimodal maps, say, and you know that they're topologically the same, you know, with a conjugacy that maps critical point to the critical point, uh, then using the real priori bounds, you can show that the conjugacy is a little bit more regular in the post-critical set, okay? It's actually a quasi-symmetric. So it's the restriction of a quasi-symmetric homeomorphism to the post-critical set. Uh, the third step in his strategy is to complexify these real dynamical systems. So now you, you, you know that as you renormalize, you're going to the class of real analytic systems. So you might as well say, well, let me start, you know, worrying about real analytic systems first. And let me try to show that if I have two such systems with the same topology, then their renormalizations are, are going to uh, converge together, uh, hopefully at an exponential rate. Okay. So... In order to do that, 
you use the fact that real analytic maps are, you know, they're just restrictions of complex analytic maps on some neighborhood of the, the of the interval in this case, or on our in our case, it's going to be on the neighborhood of a circle. And you, you hope that after you renormalize a few more times, this, this uh, complex analytic extension, which might be just, uh, you know, defined on a tiny neighborhood of the interval, will become some, you know, global holomorphic dynamical system that is more amenable to analysis. So, so you complexify and try to find some nice uh, situation, some nice holomorphic dynamical system that restricted to the real line is, 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 is the system that you're interested. So the fourth step in this strategy is to uh, get what this, what we call complex a priori bounds. So basically in, in his case, he is able to show that these unimodal maps, uh, real analytic uh, unimodal maps, after many renormalizations, they become restrictions of, of what we call uh, quadratic-like maps. And these quadratic-like maps, they they have certain they have a certain fundamental domain, which is an annulus, and this annulus has a certain modulus. And getting uh, complex bounds means getting you know bounds on these moduli of these annuli. Uh, and and and. Once you have that, you have a, a form of compactness. So you, you, you deduce that you're actually in a compact set uh, of maps in your space. All right, so, um, <clears throat> so then this fifth step is really, I already kind of more or less spoke about it in the third step. So you, 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 you now extend the renormalization operator to these complex dynamical systems, okay? So, so if you're able to do that in such a way that the renormalization that you have in the complex domain is compatible with the renormalization that you have in the real domain, then, then you, can, you can study the renormalization operator in that context. And, and the idea is that because you're dealing with complex systems, you can, you can do things uh, like use some sort of uh, Schwarz lemma in infinite dimensions, say, to try to establish this contraction property of renormalization. Well, this sixth step is really, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a lot of work here, and, and, and this sixth step is definitely the, the, the most non-trivial in this whole strategy. And in fact, Sullivan wasn't able to carry it completely through uh, using his methods, but later, uh, Kurt McMullen found a way to, to do this, to, 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 to actually get the, the exponential contraction, okay? Now, steps one and two, which are the real bounds and the quasi-symmetric uh, rigidity of these maps, these, 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 for circle maps, we have already established these uh, two steps in the previous lectures, right? I, 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 we, we have already stated the, the theorems that, that give you these, these facts. Um, so the point is really uh, to show how you you can perform these steps uh, three to six in the in the circle context, okay. Uh, but first, in order to have an uh, an appreciation and I an idea of how these things are done, we have to quickly go through over uh, how they are done in the unimodal case, which is Sullivan's original uh, case. And the key ingredient here is uh, the theory of quadratic-like maps, which is a theory developed by Duadi and Hubbard in the early 80s. So what is a quadratic-like map? A quadratic-like map is uh, simply a, a, it's a, it's a holomorphic map defined on, on, on a disk, mapping this disk onto a larger disk containing it uh, has a degree two branch cover, okay? So it has a unique critical point of degree two, and it maps a disk onto a larger disk. Okay, the, the 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 domain has to be compactly compactly contained in the range, and the map has to be proper. Okay, so <clears throat> so that you actually know that it sends boundaries to boundaries and things like that. So um, the modulus of a quadratic like map is uh, defined to be the mod conformal modulus of this annulus, uh, which is the codomain minus the domain, okay? If you want to think of a, a trivial example of a quadratic-like map, just think of the map z goes to z square, okay, taking a disk of radius 2, say, to a disk of radius 4, on which it is contained, compactly contained, 
right? So that's a very simple example. But of course, this example has a property that the, the critical point is fixed at, at the origin. You actually want the critical point to be moving around because you want a, a map which is going to be such that it, it will, you know, restrict it to the real line. It will be a unimodal map with the uh, appropriate uh, topology, namely it is, it's going to be something which is infinitely renormalizable. So we know that in these situations, the critical point actually has to be, um, it, it, it's a recurrent critical point, but it has a, a, a it, it's not periodic, okay? All right, so um, for these maps, you can, you can define a Julia set. So first you define the filled in Julia set. So what is that? You just take the codomain of the map and you take all possible pre-images under, you know, going backwards, right? You take the pre-image, the pre-image, the pre-image uh, under F, under your map F, and you take the intersection of all these guys, okay? And it turns out that this, uh, th this is actually a compact set and it's called the filled in Julia set and it's totally invariant under the dynamics, okay? The Julia set is the boundary of this set. And in the cases that we'll be interested, the, the filled in Julia set and the, uh, and the Julia set, they will co coincide, but we don't have to worry about that here. And the reason why the, the filled in Julia set is, uh, is compact, even though we are taking pre-images of things which are open, right? We're taking pre-images under holomorphic map of an open set. You get open set, open set, open set. But the intersection is a compact set. And the reason is because the map is proper. Okay, just think about it for a moment. It's a little exercise. So now every point uh, which is outside this uh, filled in Julia set uh, eventually escapes from the domain. Okay, it lands in VF outside UF and then you cannot iterate anymore. So these are precisely the points that have finite orbits so the, the, another way of saying, uh, defining the field in Julia set in this case is to say all points that have, uh, that, that you can iter iterate forever. So the annulus um, uh, VF minus UF works as a fundamental domain for the dynamics in, in the part which is kind of least interesting in the sense that the most interesting dynamics is happening, in the, happening in, inside the, the field in Julia set. Okay, so uh, the basic fact about quadratic-like maps that one has to keep in mind is that these maps are topologically and even quasi-conformally the same as actual quadratic polynomials restricted to certain, uh, to certain domains, okay? So every quadratic-like map is quasi-conformally conjugate to an actual quadratic polynomial. And by the way, I'm talking just about quadratic, quadratic, because I'm thinking of critical point of degree two, but you can also talk about polynomial-like maps with a higher degree criticalities. But we're not going to go into that here. So now it turns out that um, we are interested in, uh, in maps which are symmetric about the real axis, because when, when we restrict to the real axis, we want these quadratic-like maps to be like quadratic unimodal maps of the interval. Okay, and um, first thing that uh, Sullivan did is that he proved complex bounds for these maps. But what this means is that if you have uh, a quadratic-like map, um, or rather, let me put it this way, if you, if you have a, a quadratic unimodal map on the interval, okay, which, which is real analytic, I forgot to say that, over there, but I mean, you take a real analytic map, and uh, that you know which is is unimodal, okay, and you renormalize it enough times. So Sullivan's complex bounds tell you that if you renormalize enough times, uh, then what you get is a map which is the restriction of a quadratic-like map with good bounds. Good bounds means that the modulus of this annulus. Um, is you know is is bounded from below by some constant okay okay and he also showed that these maps are uh these quadratic like maps are themselves renormalizable i mean you can define a renormalization 
of uh, such a map when whenever the, the underlying unimodal map is renormalizable as well okay and renormalization here means what it usually means it just means like a first return map so you you look at the critical point the critical point there is a disk around the critical point which is mapped around and comes back over itself as a quadratic like map okay anyway so then Sullivan uh, shows that uh, this space of uh, quadratic like maps with the same topology, in other words, those that are topologically conjugate to one another, they're actually, um, they, they're path connected, the space is path connected. And, it, it, and the way to do that is to do what one calls a pullback argument. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> so, a pullback argument is uh, is a, I mean the pullback argument is a theorem that Sullivan proved, which is, which I'm going to illustrate in a picture in, in uh, with a picture in a moment, but it says basically that uh, if you have um, if you have a uh, qu two quadratic like maps and you know that they are quasi symmetrically conjugate on the real axis, then you can actually promote this uh, quasi-symmetric conjugacy to a, a, a global quasi-conformal conjugacy between the two, uh, the two, ho the two holomorphic uh, uh, objects. Okay. Um, so in this way, what you get is you get the steps three, four, and five of Sullivan's uh, strategy of Sullivan's recipe for renormalization. In the context of unimodal maps, Sullivan had already proved steps one and two. He had already got, he already uh, proved, he had already proved, uh, proved the real bounds and he had already uh, established this quasi-symmetric rigidity in the, in the uh, post-critical set, okay? So what remains here is step six, which is the actual, which is the fact that the renormalizations, the successive renormalizations were really contracting they're converging exponentially fast. This is much more difficult. So first, let me just give you a picture illustrating very poorly, maybe, uh, what the pullback argument is all about. So you, you, you have these uh, two quadratic-like maps that you see here in the picture, you know, F and G. Uh, you know, F maps, you know, this white disk onto this, uh, you know, larger disk containing it. The same thing for G on the side. Uh, these these little antennas that you see here, the, the, the blue one and the red one and the green one, sorry, on the, on the other side, these are representing the Julia sets, the limit sets of these maps, okay? And uh, the hypothesis is that you have a, 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 a conjugacy, a, a little H, which is a conjugacy on the post-critical sets of, the, of, of both maps. They are not conjugacies on the whole real uh, interval, okay, necessarily. They only conjugate on the post-critical set. But so H is a quasi-symmetric homeomorphism, okay, that maps the post-critical set of F onto the post-critical set of G. And what you do is you build uh, a quasi-conformal map, H sub zero, that is defined on this annulus here on, on the left side, this gray annulus on the left side, and it maps it you know, onto the uh, gray annulus on the on the right side, okay, in such a way that it conjugates the map and the boundaries. So, you know, if, if F takes a point here on the left to another point, you know, if F takes a point on the inner boundary onto a point on the outer boundary, okay, then the corresponding points uh, under H sub zero have to be mapped accordingly by G. So it has to be a conjugacy on the boundary. And that's usually, uh, you know, that's a very easy thing to arrange. But once you have this H sub zero and you have this little H, you can fill in, you can interpolate by, you know, any way you want to get a quasi-conformal homeomorphism mapping the larger disk on the left to the larger disk on the right, conjugating the dynamics on the post-critical set and also on these outer inner and outer boundary, boundaries of the annuli. And then what you can start to do is you can start taking you know, you, you use this pullback machine, which is just lifting this homeomorphism through F and G as a cover, okay? And because critical points are being mapped to critical points and so on, and the critical values, 
uh, are also corresponding. So when you lift, you 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 get a new homeomorphism, which is uh, also quasi conformal because you are lifting using holomorphic maps, and you keep doing that. You lift, 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 and then you use a compactness principle for quasi conformal maps that tell you that when quasi conformal maps are uniformly k quasi conformal for some k, which will be the case here, then you can extract limits. So in the end, you get something which is uh, a conjugacy because every time you lift, you conjugate in more places than you had before. And the pre image of any point under, uh, under F. Um, is accumulating in the Julia set of F, and the same thing is happening for G on the other side. Okay, so roughly speaking, that's what the pullback argument is accomplishing. And once you have a quasi-conformal conjugacy between these two objects, you actually have a whole path of um, uh, of systems joining the two systems because you can just take this quasi-conformal conjugacy, you can take its dilatation, multiply by t, t between zero and one. And you can solve the uh, measurable Riemann mapping. Uh, I mean, you can solve the Beltrami equation for this uh, for these Beltrami forms, and you get an entire family of systems joining F to G. Okay, so this this tells you that the um, this tells you that the space of uh, such maps, which are topologically conjugate to a given map, they are uh, th the space is is path connected. Okay, so. The aim is really renormalization contraction, but this is a very difficult step. So, uh, in fact, Sullivan used a very fancy, you know, theory. You know, he used, he used something called Riemann surface laminations. Uh, he used something like a Teichmiller theory of Riemann surface laminations to try to prove con uh, convergence of renormalizations, and he was able to prove convergence, but without a rate. He was not able to show that the the, the convergence takes place at an exponential rate. This was actually accomplished by McMullen later. In fact, it was in part due to this work that McMullen was awarded the Fields Medal. So this he used a very different method, which is inspired by uh, by a proof of the Mostow rigidity theorem. It's a long story that I cannot go into here, but he uses uh, lots of objects that introduce lots of concepts. You know, like towers of quadratic-like maps. He he talks about geometric limits of holomorphic dynamical systems. He has a concept called dynamic inflexibility. I will describe some of these things later. Uh, he talks about deep points, uniform twisting, etc. Okay. Once again, I'm skipping here uh, seminal contributions by Lyubich and Avila and, and others, but mainly Avila and Lyubich, which uh, prove this exponential convergence by other means. On the one hand, and also on the other hand, establish actually the full hyper hyperbolicity of the renormalization operator. There is an operator called the renormalization operator here, and 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 the point is to get a nice space on which it acts, and on this space to show that the operator is hyperbolic. So it has like a, it has an att hyperbolic attractor. You have really a splitting into contraction and expanding directions and things like that. So this was. This is a tour, you know, this is a, a fantastic piece of work by, by, by Lyubich and then by Avila Lyubich. And uh, I have no time to even mention any of these things any more than just saying what I just said. So, so, so the, so how do you do this uh, Sullivan strategy on the circle? So we have already steps one and two because they are real variable things and we have already proven the real bounds and also the quasi-symmetric rigidity of these critical circle maps. What we need is an analog of the uh, so-called quadratic-like maps. And these are called holomorphic dynamical systems, OK? This is something I contributed in my, my, my thesis a long time ago. But in order to define it, uh, you know, what they are, I first need to, to tell you what a bow tie is. So a bow tie is uh, just a. Uh, you know, four tuple of simply connected domains in the complex plane. Just think of uh, topological disks, and they are arranged in such a way that they are like a bow tie, okay? But they are a bow tie, which is, in some sense, immoderated. They, you know, the bow tie is inside some some larger uh, some larger object. So these are just like. You know, you, you, three of them form a bow tie, and then there's a fourth one that contains the, the other three. Okay. 
And, and, and so the way to say that is, you know, the formal definition is this definition that you see here, but I'm not going to dwell into that. Okay. Uh, I'm going to give you a picture, which is much, which, which makes it much more clear. I, I'm going to give you a picture in a moment, but, you know, just think of it as four domains in the plane that are arranged like a bow tie. So there is like a, a left side of the bow tie, a, a right side of the bow tie. There is this button here in the middle. There is this, uh, you know, this blob here in the middle. So it's a domain which which touches the other two, and then and then there is a a, a fourth domain that contains all all three of the, uh, all, all of these uh, three. Uh, and once you have this picture in mind, then I can tell you what a, a holomorphic commuting pair is. So holomorphic commuting pair is going to be something like a quadratic like map, except that well, first of all, it's not going to be a single map. We need in fact three maps to define. The pair, okay. So you have a bow tie, and uh, three of the domains, the ones that sit inside. I mean, three of these Jordan domains. They're going to be uh, the domains of three maps. They're called psi, eta, and nu, okay. Um, and these domains are going to be mapped essentially onto the larger domain, minus certain slits, but that's not important here right now. So these are the three maps. The three maps are holomorphic um, and univalent, okay, onto their images. The image is almost the whole fourth domain V here that you see, okay, except that you have to extract certain uh, strips. So I use this notation. It's, it's common to use this notation here. The C of, of, of an interval is just, you know, you, you, you take the complement of the interval on the real line and you remove it from the complex plane okay so this is a doubly slit plane anyway so uh the two maps xi and eta are univalent but the third map in the middle the one which is defined in this blob in the middle uh, is a threefold branch covering and it's so it's threefold because we are studying critical circle maps with cubic critical point okay and the idea is that psi and eta, when you restrict them to the real axis, they form a commuting pair in the sense that was previously defined in, you know, in, the, in, the, in the previous lecture. Pablo has mentioned a critical commuting pair. So psi and eta are just you know, restricted to the real axis. They're going to give you a critical commuting pair. But there are holomorphic maps now. And so they, they have to be uh, deployed on the real line, you know, uh, in the same way as a critical commuting pair. So I'm not going to go into the details of that. And the point is that the map new in the middle, which is this threefold branch covering, it really is uh, the composition of the other two. Okay. But of course, the composition of some extensions of Xi and Eta, because Xi and Eta are defined on this joint domains, as you're going to see in the next picture. Okay. And then there's some uh, topological invariance. You know, there's something called the height. I'm not going to go into that. And there's also a rotation number. You can also look at, you can look at this uh, critical commuting pair psi eta on the real line, and you can look at the rotation number of the map that it defines on the circle. So here's a picture. So it's, it's easier to represent things by, by a picture. So you have these uh, maps psi and eta, and they are mapping the, you know, Xi is mapping this whole domain O sub Xi on the left, which has these two symmetric parts, okay? But it ends here at these lines, right? And eta is this other thing on the other side, which is topologically looks the same, okay? But they're not, they're not the same at all. They are, you know, they, these domains don't need to be the same at all, okay? So this is just a schematic picture. And eta is going to, uh, uh, sorry, psi, for instance, is going to take this upper part of the domain here and is going to map it to the upper part of V, okay, everything that stays above the real axis. And the part of the domain of psi that stays in the lower half plane will, will map to the part of uh, uh, V that stays in the lower half plane as well. Okay, same thing for eta. Now, for nu, the situation is a little bit different because these um, uh, these domains, you know, the 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 the, sh the shaded domains, 
are the ones which are mapped to the upper part of V, whereas the unshaded ones inside the domain of uh, nu are mapped to the lower part, okay? Anyway, it takes a while for, for, for someone to actually get, uh, you know, acquainted with this, this object, but the, the point is that this object is the analog of a quadratic-like map for, uh, for circle maps, okay? And the dynamics, the circle dynamics is happening on the real line between eta of zero here and psi of zero, okay? Be between eta of zero on the, on the left side and psi of zero on the right side. So psi of zero and eta of zero, they are like fqn of the critical point and fqn plus one of the critical point. These are like two successive closest returns to the critical point for the circle map, okay? Now, um, you can you can ask well you know these objects can you um how do you know they exist right so you can build several examples um you can you, if you if you if you want you can look at a paper that i that i originally wrote in, in you know which is in ergodic theory in 1999 where examples are constructed explicitly using uh the arnold family okay with any with arbitrary rotation number with arbitrary uh, heights which are Anyway, I'm not going to go into that, but it's this other invariant called the height. And um, you can also derive the existence of such objects uh, indirectly as a consequence of the complex bounds, which have been proved for, proved for these objects. Okay. And I want to stress that I'm talking about cubic uh, critical points, but there's nothing special about cubic. You can deal with any uh, odd uh, power uh, criticality. And this is, in fact, has been done by, by, by a former student of mine in Orlando Vieira in his thesis. So you can develop the same theory for, you know, quintic uh, holomorphic pairs or, you know, holomorphic pairs with critical points of degree seven, nine, 11, or whatever. So they are the exact analogs of quadratic-like maps. Well, uh, to be the exact uh, analogs, we need to be able to prove certain things like, for instance, the pullback argument. And, and in, indeed, uh, there is a version of the pullback argument for such objects. And, and it's just going to say that if you have two such objects and they are quasi-symmetrically conjugate on the real line, then you can actually extend the conjugacy to a quasi-conformal conjugacy between these, these, these two uh, holomorphic objects, okay? And in fact, the, this, the quasi conformal distortion that you get depends only on the quasi symmetric distortion of the conjugacy on the real line, plus this modulus of this annulus, because I, I guess I didn't say that, but <coughs> there is an annulus here too, which is, which is just uh, this larger domain V minus the union of these three uh, smaller domains, O sub psi, O sub nu, and O sub eta, okay? Because the union of these guys is also a topological disk, okay? Anyway, so it turns out that V minus the union of these uh, three domains works as a fundamental domain for, for the dynamics. And what is the dynamics? The dynamics is the, is the pseudo group or pseudo semi group generated by all possible compositions of these maps. You compose these maps, Xi, Nu, and and eta every time you can, okay? And and so you, you're looking at this uh, pseudo semi-group generated by these, these three maps and, and that's your dynamics. Anyway, and it turns out that this dynamics can actually be shadowed by a single map, which is, you know, discontinuous, but piecewise holomorphic. Anyway, um, so, so there is a pullback argument, um, and the proof of this theorem is uh, 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 more involved than in the case of quadratic like maps. When quad for quadratic like maps, you have the straightening theorem that tells you that these maps are always uh, conjugate to actual uh, quadratic maps. And quadratic maps, because they are rational, a special case of rational maps, you have a Sullivan theorem that says that there are no wandering domains for these maps. So wandering domains are already ruled out. So you don't have to deal with them. Here, the situation is different. You, you, you don't know a priori uh, whether there are 
wandering domains or not. So you have to deal with their putative existence. So you first prove the, the, the pullback argument a theorem, this theorem, uh, with the possibility that there might be uh, wandering domains, and you rule out the wandering domains a posteriori, because then you then you go and you say, well, you know, I I can I now have this 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 object, and I know that this object is quasi conformally conjugate to another object of the same type, which lives inside the Arnold family, and for the Arnold family, you can show that there are no wandering domains, so these objects do not have wandering domains. But the, the ruling is a posteriori. So in the proof of the pullback argument, you have to deal with the possibility of uh, wandering domains, OK? And to do that, you have to do some quasi-conformal sewing, you know, using something called Bears, the Bears lemma, and I'm not going to go into that. So anyway, the other thing you can prove is that there are complex bounds for, for renormalization of, of, of commuting pairs. So you, you can start. You can start with, uh, say, a real analytic uh, critical circle map, and you start renormalizing it. So I'm thinking of it as having irrational rotation number, as always. So it, it's infinitely renormalizable. So I start renormalizing it. And after uh, finitely many renormalizations, I arrive at a situation where the critical committing pair that defines the renormalization is actually the restriction of some holomorphic commuting pair. Okay? So this is the contents of the of the, the complex bounds. The complex bounds were originally proved uh, by myself in the bounded type case, and then uh, generalized by Ian Polsky uh, for, for the unbounded uh, uh, case. I mean, when, when the ANs of the continuous fraction expansion of the rotation number are not uh, bounded. And, but in both cases, both myself and, and Ian Polsky, we both assumed um, that the maps were already in the so-called Epstein class, so they they were maps which were you know real analytic that had complex analytic extensions that were such that they these complex analytic extensions had globally defined uh, inverse branches, globally defined meaning globally defined either in the upper half plane, in the upper half plane or the lower half plane. Okay. But uh, later, uh, Wellington, De Mello, and I were able to remove this hypothesis. So um you you get the final result that every uh, sufficiently deep renormalization of a, an arbitrary real analytic critical circle map with irrational rotation number is actually the restriction of a holomorphic commuting pair and this com commuting pair has good bounds in the sense that the modulus of that annulus is bounded from below and and so on okay so in particular you see i mean uh the limits of renormalization have to be living in this class. They have to be uh, restrictions of holomorphic commuting pairs. Okay. So uh, Pablo Guarino is going to uh, explain the complex bounds in more detail in the second part of his lecture. Okay. So now, in order to get exponential contraction of renormalizations, we need. Um, a criterion which is uh, uh, due to McMullen. Okay. So first of all, let me observe a few things here, which are which are not difficult to prove, but you know, are also not obvious, completely obvious. So if you have two real analytic uh, critical circle maps, and you have a quasi-symmetric conjugacy between them, okay, mapping the critical point of one to the critical point of the other. I mean, you know. There is only one such conjugacy mapping the critical point of one to the critical point of the other. And I'm saying that that conjugacy is quasi-symmetric. We already proved this in this course. We already mentioned this, right? So start with that. And suppose that you know that the conjugacy is actually at the critical point. It's a little bit better than just being quasi-symmetric. It's what we call C1 plus epsilon at that point. What that means is that, well, H has a derivative at the critical point. And if you look at the error term when you when you write the Taylor formula, first order Taylor formula for the for the for H at that point, the error term is slightly better than linear. Okay, I mean it's it's going to zero faster than linearly. It's going to 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 zero. Say if the er, you know if the error is uh, uh, in the argument is like delta x. Okay, 
then uh, the error term is like delta x raised to some power greater than one. Okay, so suppose this happens. So you say that the map is C1 plus epsilon at that point. Okay, if it if this happens, if it's C1 plus epsilon at the critical point, then you can show that the renormalizations of the bo both maps they converge to zero exponentially fast in the C0 sense. Okay. Now, so suppose you want to show that the conjugacy is C1 plus epsilon at the critical point. Well, that's very hard to do with staying in the real line, but it, it, it would follow almost immediately if you could prove that um, this age is actually the restriction of some quasi-conformal homeomorphism that happens to be C1 plus alpha conformal at the critical point. What does that mean? That means the following. So uh, uh, a map uh, phi on the Riemann sphere, let's think of it as a homeomorphism of the Riemann sphere, which is, uh, uh, say, quasi-conformal. It doesn't need to be here. You say that this map is C1 plus alpha conformal at a certain point, P, okay? If the derivative in the complex sense exists at that point, so if phi prime exists at that point, okay? And when you write the Taylor uh, expansion, first order Taylor expansion, the error term, you see here, the error term is of the order of Z minus P raised to the one plus alpha powers, better than the DK is better than linear, okay? If this happens, you say that the map is C1 plus alpha conformal at that point. And C1 plus alpha conformality implies C1 plus epsilon conformality or some epsilon that depends on alpha, okay? That's an exercise. Um, so, so the goal is to uh, achieve this uh, C1 plus alpha conformality. So how are we going to do this? Well, McMullen has a, a, a general, uh, uh, let's say, a general machinery to get to this kind of statement for conjugacies between two holomorphic dynamical systems. And it's very broad, very general. So in, he, he actually define a very broad class of holomorphic dynamical systems for which he can prove a criterion like that. So his notion of holomorphic dynamical system is so general that it encompasses things like climbing groups on one side and uh, quadratic like maps on the other side or you know uh, 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 other other rational maps and things like that. Uh, Almost anything you can think of that has like only these holomorphic relations is is, is a is a, a holomorphic dynamical system in the sense of McMullen. So in order to formulate these definitions, first let's uh, specify here what what we mean by the space of analytic hypersurfaces. So, um, so an, an analytic hypersurface is just something that you know is a subset of. Uh, um, of the double sphere, you know, C, C hat uh, cross C hat, C hat is the Riemann sphere. So I'm, I'm calling the product a double sphere. So you look at the, the hypersurfaces in the, uh, in the double sphere, meaning these are objects which are locally the graphs of holomorphic functions from, from C hat to C hat or from, from some subdomain of C hat to, to C hat. Okay. So, <clears throat> So you, you, you now consider the space of all such analytic hypersurfaces. So let's put a topology on it. So you specify the topology by uh, telling what the convergence sequences are. So if you have a, a hypersurface F and you have a sequence of hypersurfaces Fi, then you say that the sequence Fi converges to F if the following thing happens. Well, first of all, these hypersurfaces, they have certain boundaries inside C hat plus cross C hat, okay, which is a, a compact uh, space. So these boundaries, they are closed sub subsets of uh, C hat cross C hat. And the first condition is that the boundaries of the uh, uh, hypersurfaces in the sequence, you know, the FIs, they have to converge to the boundary of F in, in the Hausdorff metric, okay, which is the appropriate uh, metric for uh, uh, the space of closed subsets of a certain of, of a certain uh, space. Okay, 
Uh, and so this is the first thing that has to happen. And the second thing that has to happen is that, you know, if you think of these hypersurfaces as being like graphs of uh, analytic functions, then the, the, the functions that represent the, the, the hypersurfaces Fi, they have to converge uniformly on compact subsets um, to the uh, holomorphic function that represents locally the, the hypersurface F, okay? So if these two things happen, then you say that the sequence Fi converges to F. And a set will be closed, a set of hypersurfaces will be closed if, it's, if, it's, if, it's, uh, if it contains the limits of these uh, convergence sequences, okay? So uh, you can actually show this is something that McMullen does in, 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 you know, in his work. He shows that uh, with this topology, the space of hypersurface is actually separable and metrizable. Okay. Anyway, uh, so what is a holomorphic dynamical system? So for, for McMullen, a holomorphic dynamical system is simply a collection of hypersurfaces. Okay. In C, C hat cross C hat. And, and what you... What does that mean? That means that, you know, think of these uh, hypersurfaces as representing relations, okay? So they could be, for instance, they could be just the relations that give you the iterates of a single map, or they could be relations which are a little bit more sophisticated, you know, they could be things like you consider the set of points in C hat cross C hat, you know, the pair ZW such that, say, Z cube is equal to W square, okay? That's an example of a relation. So that single hi uh, hypersurface, you can think of it as a dynamical system. But of course, the dynamical systems that are interesting are the ones that contains, you know, things like uh, iterates of maps and things like that. Okay, we're only interested in closed holomorphic dynamic holomorphic dynamical systems. So these these holomorphic dynamical systems, they are subsets of this the set of of the space of uh, analytic hypersurfaces in in the in this space there is a topology we want this uh, subset to be closed in that topology okay um and the geometric topology on the space of all closed uh, holomorphic dynamical systems so this is this lives in a, a a slightly higher level of abstraction the geometric topology is essentially the topology that tells you you know what are the all possible uh, limits that you can take of these uh, uh, holomorphic dynamical systems? Okay, uh, the the geometric topology is a little bit nasty. It's typically non-Hausdorff, but at least it is sequentially compact, so you can extract limits of of, of of if you're given a sequence, you can extract subsequences which are convergent and all that. Okay, once you know what a holomorphic dynamical system is, and, and I'm telling you, this is very broad. It in, in, you know, encompasses uh, things like Kleinian groups. It encompasses things like um, holomorphic maps, like quadratic maps or rational maps of Riemann sphere or transcendental maps or whatever. Um, once you know that, you, you still need to know a, a few concepts in order for me to state uh, McMullen's criterion. So McMullen defines a deep point of a compact set in the following way. So take a compact set on the, on the complex plane or in the Riemann sphere, uh, take a positive number delta. So you say that a point in the set is a delta deep point of, of, of this uh, set if, if the following thing happens. So you take the point and you take a small disk of radius r around this point, okay? Then what has to happen is that as you shrink r, the portion of lambda that is contained in, in the disk of radius r is filling the disk more and more as r goes to zero in such a way that, you know, the largest little disk that you can put in the complement of lambda inside the disk of radius r has to have radius much smaller than r, you know, r raised to a power like one plus delta, okay? So... In particular, you know, if 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 lambda has an if the point P is a is a point in the interior of lambda, then of course it is delta deep for any delta, right? But typically, the delta the lambdas that we are interested are uh, are going to be uh, are going to be compact sets that have no interior. They're things like Julia sets of of holomorphic maps or things like that. Okay, 
So that's what a deep point means. It's a point that, you know, when you zoom in near the point, your, your set lambda is filling that neighborhood more and more and more, okay, at an exponential rate in some sense. Okay. Uh, he also needs the notion of saturation. So saturation just means, you know, you take your dynamical system and, you know, it has certain relations, which are these hypersurfaces, and you add all possible sub-relations, all possible sub uh, uh, hypersurfaces of these surfaces. You add them all, okay? So that's still a dynamical system, okay? It's essentially the same original system, but now you have all these extra restrictions of all these relations and so on. So this, this is called the saturations, okay? The saturation of the dynamical system. Uh, he also needs a notion of nonlinearity. So for him, a holomorphic dynamical system is nonlinear uh, if it doesn't leave a, 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 an invariant line field, which is like par parallel line field, okay? Think of a parallel line field in the complex plane. Uh, if, if a system, if a holomorphic map leaves an invariant, you know, line field, which is parallel, like like, like, like so, you know, then it, it's a linear map. It's a complex linear map, okay? So being nonlinear means that no such invariant line field is preserved by uh, by the maps in the in the system, okay? The system itself might contain some linear map as part of it of the system, but you know the whole system cannot leave invariant the line you know a, a parallel line field uh, under all maps in the in the system under all <clears throat> relations in the system. Now he also needs a notion of twisting. So uh, a holomorphic dynamical system is uh, twisting if it has the following property. Not only is it nonlinear, but every other quasi-conformal copy of the system, every other, uh, every other system which is quasi-conformally conjugate to it, is also nonlinear. Okay? So when this happens, it says that the system is twisting. Uniform twisting is a concept that refers to a family of holomorphic dynamical systems. So now you don't have a single system, you have a family of holomorphic dynamical systems. And <clears throat> for these guys to be um, uh, uniformly twisting, then what, what happens is that if you take all possible geometric limits of, these, uh, of this family, then and you take the saturations of these guys, <clears throat> then what you get is a system which is nonlinear, is a twisting uh, system, is a, a system which is uh, quintessentially nonlinear. Okay. All right. And finally, I need a concept that I'm not going to elaborate at all, but uh, I'm just going to say the following: you can ignore this uh, item number six and uh, the way it was written. So the the thing to the, the way to think about this is the following: um, given a holomorphic dynamical system. And given any compact uh, uh, subset of the Riemann sphere, you can use these two objects to generate a family of dynamical systems. And, and the way it's done is, okay, so this compact set, you can think of it like this. You know, you, you have the compact set in the Riemann sphere, and you think of the Riemann sphere as the boundary of the hyperbolic uh, three space. Okay, so think of the ball in R3, the Riemann sphere is, is, is this shell uh, outside, and there is this ball inside. And in this ball, there is this uh, hyperbolic metric, you know, the Poincare metric. That's hyperbolic three space. And if you take any uh, compact set on the sphere, you can look at the convex hole of this guy in the uh, uh, hyperbolic uh, uh, metric sense. So you get this region inside the, the, the sphere. And now, <clears throat> so basically, any two points inside this convex hole, I mean, any two points actually on the boundary in, in this set uh, lambda can be joined by a geodesic, and the geodesic stays within uh, this, this uh, convex hole by definition, right? So imagine that you take this geodesic joining two points in, in lambda, and you take some, say, let's say you take a hyperbolic translation along this geodesic. Okay, so that's a Möbius transformation that is translating uh, points along this geodesic. 
Okay. So take this uh, Möbius transformation and take your original system and you conjugate or you take the pullback, if you will, of this system, the original system by this by this particular um, uh, fractional linear transformation, this particular Möbius transformation. So you get a new system, which is still a holomorphic dynamical system. So do that for all possible, you know, all possible geodesics joining any two points in this uh, in this lambda set. Okay. So when you do that, and you also not just translate, but you also have to use things like loxodromic elements and things like that. I'm not going to go into any of that, but you generate a whole family of systems, and these systems they are all conformally conjugate to the original system. They're all pullbacks of the original system under, under something which is actually Möbius transformations, okay? So that's this family, F lambda. So that's all you need to know about it. So with this, we can uh, state a, a criterion for when a conjugacy between two holomorphic systems is C1 plus alpha conformal at a point, okay? So that's the key here. So... So the theorem states the following. So if you have a holomorphic dynamical system and you have a compact uh, set on the Riemann sphere and you know that the pair F lambda is uniformly twisting because it's, it's a holomorphic dynamic, it's a collection of a holomorphic dynamical systems, so it makes sense to ask whether it's uniformly twisting or not. Suppose it is uniformly twisting. Then if you have a quasi-conformal homeomorphism of the Riemann sphere that takes this um, holomorphic system F to another holomorphic dynamical system F prime, then for each delta D point P in lambda, okay, this conjugacy phi is actually C1 plus alpha conformal at that point, okay? Provided the point is a delta D point, provided the point is a D point. So if you have a D point on this lambda, and the system generated by F, the original system, and lambda is uniformly twisting, then the conjugacy between F and any other system, okay, any quasi-conformal conjugacy between this system and another system will have to be C1 plus alpha conformal at the point P, okay? Now, uh, this uniform twisting condition is a little bit, of course, mysterious here. I mean, delta D point is something that you can easily understand geometrically, to understand uniformly uh, the, the uniform twisting condition, you really have to work through the definitions I've given you before, and that's not an easy task. It takes a while. But what I can tell you is the following, is that there is an easy uh, sufficient condition for a system to be uniformly twisting, which is the following. So let's say your system consists of uh, uh, some quadratic-like map. So you have a quadratic-like map, you know, all of its iterates and so on. And you want to know if this uniform twisting condition is satisfied for the system. Well, suppose you know that for each point in the Julia set or the limit set of this of this dynamical system, suppose you know that for each point, at each at each point, if I give you an R, any R, and you take the disk of radius R around that point, inside that disk you can find a small conformal copy of your entire system. If you can do that, then you can prove that the system is uniformly twisting. And it, it is in this form that you use, that you apply the, the, the hypothesis, okay? Um, so how do we prove exponential convergence of renormalizations of, of, of critical circle maps? Is by, first of all, embedding the problem in a problem of understanding renormalization of uh, holomorphic commuting pairs, and then showing that these holomorphic commuting pairs satisfy this uniformly twisting, this uniform twisting condition, and also showing that the critical point of these commuting pairs is a deep point for the dynamics. And this is exactly what was accomplished <coughs> in, in a paper by, by Wellington de Mello and myself in actually two there are two papers, but I mean, this is the, the two theorems I'm going to state are in the second paper, okay? So the first uh, theorem says that if you have a holomorphic uh, commuting pair, okay, with arbitrary irrational rotation numbers, so here the, the, the rotation number can be any, any irrational number, okay? 
then there exists some delta such that the critical point of your holomorphic commuting pair is a delta d point of the limit set. Okay, so this means that near, you know as you get closer and closer and closer to the critical point and you zoom in, you you see that the limit set fills more and more and more of the disk of the the disks that you get by blowing up at an exponential rate in some sense in in the house of metric sense if you will okay um so that's that's one 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 theorem it's showing that the critical that the holomorphic committing pairs uh, are such that they have deep points uh, the the critical point is a deep point and the second is this uniform twisting condition so we show that uh, near arbitrarily near any point in the limit set of a holomorphic commuting pair, you will find small copies of high renormalizations of your commuting pair, which in particular are nonlinear, right? Okay, so this, this result uh, requires a bounded uh, type hypothesis on the rotation number. We can only show uh, this, this result for bounded type rotation numbers and the reason should be clear because if you remember the geometry of critical circle maps when they have very large ANs you have a situation where you have an almost settled node right bifurcation so when you have look at a high return map uh, a high return of the map you know if you look at some FQN for large N what you will see is that when you plot the graph of FQN it's almost tangent to the diagonal <coughs> at some point so obviously you know, you have, if you think of this picture of the fundamental domains that you have for the dynamics there, you have these fundamental domains going across. When you're very close to this almost set or node that you have, you know, the, you know, the copies of your system that you're getting, they're getting very, very small, okay? So there is not much of a, a hope to get uh, the statement of this last theorem here in the case of unbounded uh, type. And in fact, in order to study the unbounded type case, one needs to understand what's called parabolic renormalization, which is something I'm not going to talk about. In fact, I'm at the end of my talk by now. The, um, the unbounded uh, combinatorics case was uh, really uh, accomplished by Ian Polsky. He, he, he used this uh, very nice uh, theory of parabolic renormalization that he developed for this purpose, okay? And uh, that's it. So once you have this, you have exponential convergence of renormalizations, and therefore, by what we did in the previous lectures, you have the smooth rigidity of these uh, critical circle maps. This is only for one critical point. For more critical points, there's some new developments, recent developments. Maybe Pablo will mention this in the next uh, part of the lecture, the second part of the lecture, okay? So I will end here, but uh, so, I thank you very much, but please stay tuned for the second part, which will be uh, presented by Pablo. Thank you very much. So, hello. So, uh, this is welcome to the second part of lecture five, our final lecture. So, this is the final part of our final lecture. I hope you are still there, still alive, still happy. So this is just a complement of what uh, Edson was explaining. So this lecture is this final lecture is about holomorphic methods in circle dynamics in general in one-dimensional dynamics. Uh, the content of chapter 14 of our book, which I hope you are reading or you already have read, and. Uh, so he was explaining, he was talking about holomorphic commuting pairs, Sullivan's program on renormalization, on complex renormalization, McMullen, uh, McMullen's tools or machinery, as people said, in order to prove exponential conversions of renormalization, which is, as we saw in lecture four, is kind of the main, the main goal and, and the main task in this, in this area. And then I will try to complement a bit about what he was saying, in particular to focus on the complex ones. At some point, he states, the, he stated on his on this first part of lecture five, the complex bounds. And now I just want to talk a little bit about that, just to finish, and in particular to present some some nice tools uh, coming uh, 
from complex dynamics. So right now we are complexifying our dy real dynamical systems and we are trying to understand what's going on with these complexifications and new tools appear. Some of them were already presented, well, just to introduce a few more. So, okay, lecture five, part two. And, uh, and as I was saying, I, I would like to sketch a proof or at least present the main tools uh, in the proof or the main ideas in the proof of the complex bounds. So, but for this, I, I want to remind you the statement of the complex bounds. And for this, I need to recall uh, a couple of notions, a couple of concepts. One is the notion of uh, conformal modules. So for those who don't know, maybe you don't know what it is. So let me define what it is and explain what it is. So the conformal modulus. So let's say, so you have a Riemann surface S, and we will say that this Riemann surface is an annular Riemann surface if its fundamental group is isomorphic to the integers group, to the additive group of integer numbers. Okay? So it has the same homotopy type as the circle. This is an annular Riemann surface, and if you think on the complex plane, what we usually call topological annulus in the complex plane is what? It's an open and connected set in the plane whose fundamental group is isomorphic to the So th this is the idea. In general, you can do it for abstract Riemann surfaces. And, uh, and what you can prove, of course, uh, here uh, I will invoke a huge theorem, a beautiful theorem or theory, which is the uniformization theorem. So using the uniformization theorem, you ca it's not so difficult to prove the following. If you have an annular Riemann surface, then it has to be conformally equivalent either to a puncture plane or to a puncture disk or to a round annulus. Uh, a round annulus here, the notation, the same as in the book, is A sub uh, little r capital R. So these are the radius. So you have two circles, round circles, and then the annulus in the middle, okay? And uh, so here, just to, what it means conformally equivalent means that you have a biholomorphism between your ribbon surface and one of these guys. So you have a bisection, bisection, sorry, which is holomorphic, okay? And, and then it is a, a biholomorphism. So, okay, uh, this in, uh, we, we put this as an exercise in the book. Uh, I think it is in chapter 11, uh, which is the, the, the first moment in the book that we mentioned this concept of modules. So, of course, uh, if you want to prove it directly, this is quite hard, the exercise, says what you can see in the screen using the statement of the uniformization theorem then this is not so difficult just to explain why if you have a, a puncture plane say the, the plane minus the origin then uh, the universal cover of the puncture plane is, is the plane itself right and in, and in fact the exponential the standard exponential map will play the role of a universal covering map right Otherwise, if you are not conformally equivalent to a puncture plane, then what the uniformization theorem will tell you is that you can realize your Riemann surface as a quotient of the upper half plane uh, by, by a group of Mebius transformation, this, the, the so-called Fuchsian groups, for those who know. So you have a group of Mebius transformations acting on the upper half plane with no fixed point, acting properly discontinuous, so on in such a way that when you take the quotient of the upper half plane by this group, you obtain a copy, a conformal equivalent copy of your Riemann surface. This is a huge statement, which is what the uniformization theorem will tell you for annular Riemann surface, if you already know that you are not a conformal equivalent to a puncture plane, okay? And the thing is, since you are taking the universal cover, this group uh, of Mebius transformations, this function group that I was mentioning, is iso isomorphic to your fundamental group. And in this case, your fundamental group is just uh, the integers. So what this means is that there exists one Mebius, one generator, one Mebius transformation that generates your group. Your group is uh, infinitely cyclic, uh, given by a Mebius transformation. And then the question is, okay, uh, then you need to discuss about uh, which Mebius transformation you have, and the thing is the following. Okay, this Mebius transformation has no fixed points in the upper half plane, and it has, uh, when you take the closure of the upper half plane, it has fixed point, but at most two. 
And why? Well, it's a Mavius transformation. If, if it has three fixed points, it has to be the identity, which is not. So then you need to discuss uh, on the number of fixed points. So either you have one fixed point at the boundary of the upper half plane or two. These are the only, uh, your only possible cases. And then if you have one fixed point, uh, you can take a Mavius transformation. You send this point to infinity. And when you conjugate your generator with this Mavius transformation that it's sending the fixed point to infinity, you will get a translation, a horizontal translation. And then, okay, if you take the quotient of the upper half plane by an horizontal translation, what you get is, is a puncture disk. This is part of the exercise. I'm just uh, trying to explain the proof. So in that case, okay, you have a puncture disk, which is the second case in, in this uh, short list that is uh, on the screen. If you have two fixed points, you can send them, again, with a Mavius transformation to zero and infinity. And then if you conjugate your generator, what you have is a homotety, right? Uh, which fixes zero and infinity, precisely. And then the quotient uh, of the upper half plane by the group generated by this uh, homotety, homotety means uh, multiplied by a positive real number. Uh, then this quotient will give you a, a round annulus and in fact, the number that you are multiplying, uh, the coefficient of your homotopy is given by the ratio between these two guys, capital R and little r. Okay? This was just the idea how you, you need to use to solve the, this exercise. Uh, we wrote this hint in chapter 11, so I hope it's okay. And uh, in any case, you have this, and uh, and whenever you are conformally equivalent to one of these round annulus, this ratio, capital R divided by little r, uh, is almost what we will call the modulus. Actually, the logarithm of this ratio, let me put it here, here it is, the modulus of your annular, annular Riemann surface is the logarithm of this ratio between capital R and little r, okay? So some, this is a positive number, and somehow is measuring how, how big or how fat your, your rim. If you think on topological annulus, let's go back to the case that actually is the one we are interested. So you have an open and connected set in the complex plane with this fundamental group. Then of course, uh, you have two boundaries, which are, it might be horrible uh, curves. I mean, it, they might not even be locally connected at some point. You, you don't need to ask for smooth curves, not at all. And uh, in any case, you have this topological annulus and you have this positive number. That's somehow it telling you how fat or how big, whatever you prefer, is your annulus, okay? It's a, a way to measure the size of this annulus, okay? It's kind of famous in complex analysis, of course, well, uh, Tage Muller theory and so on, but here you have the definition. So let me remind you the second notion that I need to do. I hope this one is more fresh because Edson was explaining the first part of this <laughs> lecture, which is the notion of holomorphic commuting parts. Quite important in the theory, in our book, and certainly in this lecture. So, but Edson was explaining. In fact, this, this notion was introduced by Edson in his PhD thesis. And then you have the picture here, the same one as we have in the book. Uh, you have these three domains inside a, a codomain, right? Compactly contained in this codomain. This is called a bow tie. And, and you can see why, you know, the, the shape of these three domains all together. It looks like a bow tie. And then, okay, it's already gave this definition. I put it here, but you know, these are the three of these guys are topological disk. The big codomain is a topological disk too. Uh, these guys, they only touch a uh, at zero, and then you have this, uh, this difference, if you remove one of the other in all these possible ways, they are all connected, one piece, okay? So right now this is, I'm talking only about the domains, but then you can see that there are some dynamics here, eta, psi, and nu, that will be the composition of eta and psi. So just to remind you, the holomorphic pair, uh, the final on, on, on a bow tie configuration, is given by these three maps. Actually, you will say, but why you are calling it a pair if there are three maps? Uh, the important maps are eta and psi, okay? The other one is just to have the commuting condition. The idea here is that in the real line, you have a critical commuting pair, 
in the standard way, which is real analytic, and then you are taking the holomorphic extensions of these guys. Of course, the holomorphic extensions are uniquely defined, but then you can choose uh, in which domains you will restrict this holomorphic extension. This is the main idea. So, as you can see here, eta and psi will have a critical point at zero, and then you are considering these domains in such a way that inside this domain, both eta and psi are univalent. Remember, univalent mean, means holomorphic and injective, so you have no uh, critical points inside. You only have regular points, uh, or in another way, they are a diffeo onto the image, a holomorphic diffeo onto the image, which is this big guy, V. I'm, I'm just saying quickly, talking quickly about this, because Edson just explained this, and he knows this better than anyone, so what could I say after? His explanation. So then you have the, the, the same, this is the definition, the same one that is on the book and that he was talking about. So let's go back to the picture. This is the dynamical picture. And of course, remember, in the real domains, you have a commuting pair, irrational rotation number, all the theory that we know, no periodic orbits, and so on. As soon as you take these holomorphic extensions, you have here a, a very complicated dynamical system. I mean, here you have a Julia set, uh, here you have uh, infinitely many periodic orbits, here you have positive topological entropy. So, uh, well, the same situation as you always have when, when you look at Julia sets. Dynamically, they are uh, quite complicated. But what we will try to understand, at least in this, in this part, in this final lecture, is the geometry of this mass, not the dynamical properties, but the geometry. So, just to be more clear, here you have a topological annulus which is given by uh, removing from, from the codomain V uh, the three little domains here, the, the, the bow tie, the actual bow tie. So, if you remove these three guys, remember that the union of these three guys is called U, which is here. So, uh, the domain V minus U is a topological annulus. And then it has a modulus, the way that we were explaining before. And we will say that the conformal type of gamma is the modulus of V minus U. Okay? So the domains are compactly contained in the codomain, and the conformal type will tell you somehow uh, how much space you have in between. Okay? How much they are uh, well within contained in the codomain. Okay? And of course, this will tell you about the expansion of these maps. Remember that both eta and psi, when restricted to the corresponding domains, are by holomorphisms onto B. Okay? So, what Edson already explained. So, uh, up to now, this is a definition, uh, and you may be wondering so, where the, this definition came from, where this uh, idea of holomorphic commuting pair and all this configuration came from, and then, uh, as Edson has explained, these uh, things appear, these objects appear naturally. Uh, for instance, in the following way, if you take a real analytic critical commuting pair, or directly a real analytic critical circle map with irrational rotation number, and you start to renormalize, after a few, uh, after a finitely many renormalizations, you will see these configurations for the complex extension. Okay? So, we already understand the real dynamics of these return maps that, that uh, made up the, renormal, the nth renormalization of F. I'm talking about FQN restricted on IM plus one, FQN plus one restricted to IM. In the real line, we understand the, the whole dynamical pictures. We have real bounds, so we have even geometrical uh, information. But then now, we are taking complex extension of these guys, holomorphic extensions, and we want to know also what happens in the complex plane. And as I was explaining, this is much more difficult because in the complex plane, you will see a much more complicated dynamical system. Again, positive topological entropy, infinitely many periodic orbits, and so on. So it is a much more difficult object to study, but what we will be able to prove uh, in, this, in this final lecture, in this final part of the final lecture, is that at least the following humble statement that you always have good space in between the domains and the codomains. So these conformal types, after a few 
number of free normalizations will be always bounded away from zero. You have a, a lower bound for the modulus of the topological angles. This is the statement of the complex bounds. Let me remind you the complex bound. Okay, so here we are. So we are back in critical circle maps. F is a critical circle map, real analytic, because we want to take holomorphic extension. So again, you have the unit circle. Now we are thinking on the circle inside a cylinder, right? And then what we have is a holomorphic map defined in an, in a, an annulus. We don't know how, how big this annulus is, but there is an open annulus around the unit circle where F uh, extends as a holomorphic map. Of course, we are assuming irrational rotation number, just to be infinitely renormalizable. This is clear from lecture four, I hope. And then the statement is what I was saying. After a few renormalizations, uh, your real one-dimensional critical commuting pair, Rn of f, extends to a holomorphic commuting pair in the way previously defined, and moreover, your conformal type will be bounded from below, okay? This is the statement of the complex bound. So again, uh, we have, what we, we are getting here is geometrical information, not so dynamical information, but geometrical information. In the same spirit as the real bounds, what, what you are looking for here is, uh, is some pre-compactness. Remember, when you're renormalizing, uh, you are studying a dynamical system inside an infinite dimensional space. So a priori, you, have not, you don't know nothing uh, about uh, accumulation points, about recurrence, about nothing, because your renormalization orbit may accumulate nowhere. So the real bounds and then the complex bounds are uh, statements about pre-compactness, right? It's a way to control these orbits and then to prove that they are accumulating somewhere and these accumulation points has to have nice properties and so on. I think Edson already explained this, so this is just a comment. So I want to focus on, on how you prove a statement like this, at least to give an idea of the tools and maybe a sketch of the tools. So let me give you some history uh, before we get into the mathematics. So it has some, this statement has some, some history. It was first proved by Edson on his PhD thesis, again, uh, with two conditions that are not in this statement. So the first condition is that uh, not, not only your critical circle maps, they were uh, analytic, but they were in the Epstein class. And I don't know, th this is on the book, but well, I, I, am, I won't say that much about the Epstein class, so I didn't wrote down the definition, but just to remind you, so you have these holomorphic extensions. And then one thing that we will consider that is usually good to consider are inverse branches. And then being in the Epstein class means that these inverse branches are globally defined. The holomorphic extension is globally defined. Okay? This is the definition of being in the Epstein class. And we will see in a few minutes why this is a, a good uh, hypothesis. If you want to prove complex bound, this will be clear. Uh, and then another uh, condition that uh, he was he needed to require was a bounded type uh, rotation number. So the irrational rotation numbers were of bounded type. This condition was later removed by Misha, Misha Yampolsky. He was still working in the Epstein class, but he was able to consider also unbounded rotation numbers, okay? This was, uh, as far as I understand, part of also of his PhD thesis. So these two uh, works are, are from the 90s, and, you know, they were the, for circle maps, they were the first uh, complex bound statements available. And then later, I think this was in 2000, Edson himself and Wellington, uh, Wellington de Mello, they proved the general statement that I wrote here. So the theorem that you, that you see on, on the screen, this is what I call the general case. And general means because you are just taking any analytic map. You are not requiring nothing about uh, how big are the domains of holomorphicity of the inverse branches, and also for any rational rotation number, because you can see uh, up there that there is no restriction on the rotation number in our statement. So the statement that, that I will try to explain is this one, okay? And then let me 
make a remark. Uh, quite recently, Misha, uh, Misha Jampolsky, again, he announced that he was able to prove complex bounds for multi-critical circle maps uh, and for a rational rotation number of bounded types. So for bounded combinatorics, but allowing any number of critical points, okay? This is uh, quite a, an improvement. So let me remind you, let me go back to this picture. So here, as I was saying, inside these domains, is uh, suitably choose domains, both it and xi were by holomorphisms onto its image. This is part of the definition. Somewhere this is here. Both xi and it are univalent. Blah, blah, blah. So the critical points that you have here, you have a critical point at zero. This is uh, your real critical point. And then you will have critical points uh, in these boundaries because in the complex plane, you have critical points. These are points that eventually land on the real line and then are critical point for the return maps. So all these guys are in the boundary, but here inside you don't have critical points in the unicritical case. So for the multi-critical case, this is no longer true. So uh, if you want to prove this statement that Misha has announced, you need to consider you will have critical points. Actually, you will have critical points in the interval, in the one-dimensional domain. So you need to deal with these guys. And he was able to do it. So this is quite, I think this is a, a preprint. It, it's an archive from 2020 or something like this. This is quite recent. So bounded combinatorics, but any number of critical points. So, but still, let me say that the idea of the proof is the same that uh, we are presenting on this book, is the same that I will discuss here. Uh, it's the same that was presented, for instance, in this first work by Misha uh, on, on, on the late 90s. So, of course, with more details to deal with because you have these new critical points, but uh, some of the tools that I will present right now are also present here in this, in this recent development. Okay? Okay, so this was the statement of the complex bounds. Now I will try to talk a little bit about this uh, geometrical tools that appear. So let's go back. You have these return maps, FQN, FQN plus one. You understand the real geometry and the real dynamics that they have. But now you have this holomorphic extension. And you want to understand how the holomorphic domains return. In principle, you have nothing. And then which tools we will use to understand these complex extensions, at least geometrically, as I was saying, these return maps, if you study them dynamically, they are quite uh, complicated. But we will just talk about geometry because we just want to bound this, uh, the modulus of these topological angles. And then, OK, important and very nice tools here, I, I like these things uh, a lot, are the Poincaré disk and all the Schwarz inclusion. So let me present these guys. So this, uh, as I wrote here, uh, these are tools coming from one-dimensional, eh, complex one-dimensional hyperbolic geometry. So, okay, we are dealing with interval dynamics, uh, one dimension, real one-dimensional dynamics, and we want to consider holomorphic extension, right? So, given an interval, we will use this notation uh, CI, uh, so if, if you, uh, which is the following. You take the upper half plane, the lower half plane, and then you glue them, uh, with your interval. So you put your little interval to glue these two uh, open half planes, the upper and the lower half plane. Okay? So, or in another way, you have the interval, and what you remove from the complex plane is the complement of your interval in the real line. Okay? This is CI. And of course, CI is conformally equivalent to, uh, to the unit disk, right? This is the content of the Riemann mapping theorem that I hope you are familiar, like, and uh, so this is an open and connected set. It is not the whole plane because you are removing these two slides. So there is a biholomorphism from CI uh, to the unit disk. Okay, and then in the unit disk, uh, there is this uh, beautiful uh, Riemannian metric called the hyperbolic metric or the Poincaré metric, which I hope you are familiar too. Right, the, the, the standard Poincaré metric in the unit disk, it is called hyperbolic in, in, in geometry. Hyperbolic means negative curvature, right? So this metric, if you normalize it, it has curvature constant curvature equal to minus one, right? 
And, uh, and then what you can do, since you have a bi-holable feature, you pull back this metric to your domain CI, okay? So this is what is written here. Using the Riemann mapping theorem, you just pull back uh, the, the Poincaré metric for, for, from the unit disk to your domain CI, okay? And then you have a hyperbolic Riemannian metric, very nice uh, Riemannian metric, a complete uh, Riemannian metric, and so on. You have a nice group of automorphisms, of isometries, as you have in the unit disk, remember that the Mebius transformations are the, the orientation preserving isometries of the of the of this Riemannian metric. And then, well, in particular, of course, your interval is a geodesic, right? Uh, because of, of the symmetry that, that you have. And then uh, let me define specific neighborhoods of your interval i that we will consider. So, well, you have the picture here, you can see them. So, given a angle theta, so we will use angles between zero and pi. Angle zero means that, that you are in the real line, looking in the positive orientation of the real line. This is angle just with the polar coordinates, you know, the undergraduate courses. And then you have angle zero, and then you go until angle pi to the other side, okay? And then given some angle theta, what you consider this disk, uh, that forms angle theta with the with the real line. This is the point B. This should be the interval I, right? And then you take the upper part of this disk and then its symmetric part. So D plus is the upper part and D minus is the, the Im its image under, under complex conjugation, right? And then this is what we call a Poincaré disk. And we glue these two to we glue d plus and d minus with our interval i, right? So you have i, and then you have this little thing up and down, okay? And then of course it depends on the side. Here, here you have three cases when theta is between zero and pi over two, you have this huge uh, domain. When theta is exactly pi over two, uh, the, your Poincaré disk is actually an Euclidean disk, the Euclidean disk of diameter i, and then when theta is uh, closer to pi, you have this little neighborhood. So in the middle right here, it looks like an Euclidean neighborhood, but, but when you go uh, close to the boundary, either uh, A or B, uh, the boundary points of, of your interval I, this has to shrink. It is not at all uh, looking like an Euclidean neighborhood. And this is because the, the hyperbolic metric gets uh, heavier and heavier around these points because remember that from here and here you don't have uh, your domain CI, right? So sorry, I'm, I'm saying the hyperbolic metric, I didn't relate yet the Poincaré disk with the hyperbolic metric, I will do it in the next slide, sorry about that. But then, okay, this is just a Euclidean object if you want. I mean, this, uh, as it's written here, the Poincaré disk of angle theta is the set of points in the complex plane that view here is the word view your interval i under an angle at least theta or even greater than theta. This is why if you have a point here and you, uh, you draw the rays connecting your point with a and b, which are the boundary points of your interval i, the angle that you have here is greater than theta. If you are at the boundary here, it is exactly theta, but then if you're outside, the angle that you will see is smaller than theta. Okay, so this is just clear, but then, these two things, the hyperbolic metric that I just defined on the previous slide, and this uh, Poincaré disk, they have a relation, and is the following. Well, there is a formula which is not very nice. Uh, so, okay, so for any angle theta between zero and pi, you can consider this positive number, which is this formula, the logarithm of the tangent of pi over two minus uh, theta over four, and there is an exercise, uh, which is on our book, I think it is in chapter 13, that we discuss about this Poincaré disk. The exercise asks you to prove that the Poincaré disk of angle theta is exactly the set of points in this hyperbolic space, CI, uh, with distance less than epsilon to your interval i. So you have your interval i, you want to take an epsilon neighborhood of your interval i, this will be a Poincaré disk, and the relation between it, uh, sorry, theta and epsilon is given by this formula. So this formula is a diffio. It is a diffio between zero pi and, and the positive numbers. Uh, 
is of course a real analytic diffusion. It is orientation reversing. You can see here a minus sign in front of theta. And it makes sense because uh, if your angle theta is close to zero, you have a huge Poincare disk, means that epsilon is uh, almost infinity. But then if theta start to go from zero to pi, then you are close in this domain. So epsilon is going to zero. And if theta is quite close to pi, we saw it in the previous picture, epsilon here is close to zero. So this is an orientation reverse in diffusion, and this makes sense, but then you need to compute. So this exercise, I mean, it depends. If you have some background in, you know, you already know the Poincaré metric on the unit disk, maybe transformation, Fuchsian groups, and uh, then probably you don't want to, to do this exercise, and it's okay you don't want to do this computation, and it's okay. Otherwise, I think it is interesting to get familiar with this object, uh, uh, to try to compute this, to try to reach this uh, horrible expression, the logarithm of the tangent of whatever. I think it is an, an, an interesting exercise. I remember uh, I, this, I, I saw this formula in the paper by Jan Polsky that I mentioned before, the first paper on complex bound for Epstein maps. And I remember I was like, whoa. And then I went and I tried to, to reach uh, this formula. And I was able to do it, and I think it is a nice exercise. I was a PhD student at the time. So it, it, it makes sense to put it as an exercise. Anyway, but this relates. So this Poincaré disk that I was introducing are exactly epsilon neighborhoods for the metric that we previously defined. And then uh, it is a great moment to recall uh, the Schwarz lemma from complex analysis. If you have a holomorphic uh, map from the unit disk to itself, you know that it does not expand uh, the Poincaré metric, right, between points. It is either a strict contraction at all points, or it, or it might be a local isometry, a local diffusion, which is an isometry. You have two possibilities, right? This is the classical Schwarz lemma uh, written down in terms of the hyperbolic metric. And then if you translate this lemma to, the, to this language that we have introduced, you get the following. So now you have two intervals, i and j, are real intervals, and you will have a map that maps i to j, you know, it will be, for us, it is a branch of some one-dimensional dynamic. And, uh, but, and this is the important part here, your holomorph the holomorphic extension of your map is globally defined in the whole CI. This is an important part here, okay? So uh, you have your interval, your holomorphic map is globally defined. Then if you have this for any Poincaré disk, meaning for any angle that you take, theta, you have the following inclusion. Phi of this Poincaré disk is contained inside the corresponding Poincaré disk around the interval j with the same angle. So the important part here is that this theta is the same as this one. You map your Poincaré disk, you get some shape. It's not a Poincaré disk, it's something, but it's inside uh, the corresponding Poincaré disk with the same angle, okay? This is the Schwarz inclusion that you get from the, Schwarz, the standard Schwarz lemma. But then you need this to be globally defined, of course, otherwise it's not true. If you take, a, you cannot apply your Schwarz lemma to a map which is not globally defined in the whole unit disk. If it is defined on a very small open set, there is no Schwarz lemma, okay? So this is the same thing, right? And then, this is why the Epstein condition appears naturally here. So. At some point, you are interested, you are taking backward iterations. Somehow, you iterate until your return map, FQM plus one, and you want to understand how things comes back, how things come back with your dynamics. And when you are taking these backward iterations, if, you're, if your holomorphic extensions are globally defined, then you can apply this Schwarz lemma and controls the behavior of points. Because if you're inside a Poincaré disk, you know that applying this, uh, inverse branches, you are not going far uh, in terms of this metric for the Poincaré disk, okay? So for these metrics, you are always at the same distance. So you can apply directly this Schwarz lemma if your maps are in the Epstein class. And this, this is why in the first complex bounds statement that I was mentioning, there was this hypothesis of being in the Epstein class, okay? 
So, okay, so I hope this is clear. And then the question is, okay, but the statement that we have, that we want to prove right now, we don't have Epstein maps. So we have real analytic maps, but then the, the domains of holomorphicity might be very small. We cannot apply this because probably our inverse branches are not globally defining the whole CI. So what can we do? And then this is the question, what happens with holomorphic maps they are holomorphic, but they are not globally defined in the whole CI. And then, well, the answer came, uh, there is a lemma by Edson and Wellington, which is the following. So there are some constants. This is the, the, the same statement as in the book. Let me kind of go quickly. The important part is down here. So you have a Poincaré disk of angle theta. You map under your holomorphic map. In, here is denoted by capital F. And then you are inside a new Poincaré disk, not of angle theta. So there is some loss of angle. You are losing some angle. You need to open a little bit, but not that much. So there is a constant here, which is one minus. I hope it's clear. Sometimes the quality of the image is not so good. I hope it's clear here. There is a power of one plus delta. But this is, I mean, this is, I, I took it from the book. I just copy and paste it from the book so you, you can have it there. And then what I was saying, so actually the proof of this lemma is not so difficult. This is one of these statements that is more difficult to, to have the statement than then to prove it, right? To prove it is okay, but you need to understand, to have the idea that this is probably true. And then this was proved, as I was saying, by Edson and Wellington in 2000. And this is the key, as we will see, to get rid of the Epstein uh, condition. They were able to get rid of the Epstein condition because of this level, okay? Which is saying that despite the fact that your inverse branches are not globally defined, you are losing angle, but this loss, you have a good control of, of, on this loss, okay? And this depends on A, well, I mean, we will see later how we apply this. But then before we see how we apply this, let me make a digression because in our book we discuss also this nice notion of asymptotically holomorphic maps. So for asymptotically holomorphic maps, some parts of this game you can play it too. And then let me try to explain that. So let me make a digression, a very short digression on asymptotically holomorphic maps. So the situation is, is kind of the same. You have an interval, you have a neighborhood, U is a complex neighborhood of your interval, and then you have a map defined on this neighborhood, but this is just a smooth map, let's say a C1 map, okay? And then there is a definition, what it means to be asymptotically holomorphic. And then it means the following, so if you take points in your little interval, in the real interval, right, called I, then the d bar derivative of your map H is zero. And close to it, if you're outside, but close to this interval, the d bar derivative goes to zero as you approach the real line. And it goes to zero with a rate, so this is the definition of being asymptotically holomorphic of order R. And it says that it goes to zero, and even if you divide by the imaginary part of, so you're, you're in the complex plane and you're going to the real line, so your imaginary part is going to zero, and you take the power R minus one, and still this ratio goes to zero as you go to the real line, okay? So this is the definition of being asymptotically holomorphic. The idea is that you are not holomorphic, your d bar derivative is not zero, but is quite close to zero, and quite close being uh, this rate R that, that, that we have here, okay? This is a definition from, this is not a dynamical definition, it comes from analysis. Uh, then, okay, you can be, you can have this property in the whole real line, so you just say being asymptotically holomorphic, it's always been this. And then what happens is the following. So now you take a one-dimensional map. You have little h, defined on an interval i, uh, to the real line, it's a diffeo onto its image, c3 diffeo. which is kind of the usual. So remember, we are thinking about these return maps, FQM plus one. So in your first iterate, you have a critical point and you behave like a power. 
say saying that you have a cubic critical point. I'm always assuming cubic critical point. I forgot to say that, but it, it was already implicit in the definition of holomorphic commuting pairs, right? We were talking about a threefold covering and so on. I forgot to say that. But uh, as I was saying, so in your first iterate, you behave like, like a power of three, but then you are always a diffio until you come back. So at each iterate, you have a C3 diffio onto its image. And then, so you have little h, and then you take capital H, which is a C3 extension to, to a complex neighborhood of class C3, which is asymptotically holomorphic of order three. And this can always be done. Uh, we borrow from a paper that I will mention in a minute by Grashik, Sands, and Shantek. We borrow in the book a possible construction, a possible way, actually a, a quite suitable way because it has very nice property to construct these extensions. And uh, so this can always be done. And then what you have for this extension is also uh, the same almost Schwarz inclusion that you have before, almost the same. Let me give a precise statement. Uh, which again is borrowed from this paper by Grashik, Sands, and Jantek. And then you have here, again, the important, the inclusion is given here. A uh, Poincare disk of angle theta is mapped into, is inside a Poincare disk of angle tilde theta. And the relation between these, these two angles depends on the size of your Poincare disk. So this here, this is the Euclidean diameter of the Poincare disk. We are assuming that it's small, but this is a universal constant delta. So you have a small uh, Poincare disk. It has a diameter. You multiply by the length of the interval. And of course, if you're renormalizing and if you're looking at smaller and smaller scales, this is what, what it means to be renormalizing, these numbers are going to zero. So uh, the loss of angle that you have when you are iterating an asymptotically holomorphic map will go to zero, the loss of angle will go to zero if you are renormalizing on deep, deeper and deeper levels, okay? So this almost Schwarz inclusion allows you to play actually more or less the same game that it can be played for analytic maps. And in fact, the same game that it was played before for Epstein maps. So you see, the class of dynamics that, that we are able to, to play with, on disk and so on, are, is increasing, right? So this, as I was saying, is, is, is was proved by Grashik, Sands, and Shantek in a paper from 2005. And it is a, well, I, I, I like this, this proposition and this, this special asymptotically holomorphic extensions a lot. In chapter 13 of the book, uh, you have uh, applications of this stuff to, to critical circle maps, to smooth critical circle and in fact, the relation between smooth critical circle maps and analytic critical circle maps in our book uh, is uh, it relies deeply on this notion. So, so, so we owe a lot of, of this paper. Okay, so but let me go back. Uh, we will, I will try to present this, the application of the almost Schwarz inclusion just in the analytic case. So the statement is the one that I gave uh, of the complex bank. But again, just to, you, you should keep in mind that you can play the same game with asymptotically holomorphic maps of class C3, okay? And then, okay, how you can apply, let me, I think maybe I'm talking too much, so let's go. How you can apply the asymptotic, the almost Schwarz inclusion to critical circle maps. So we are back in our business. F is a real analytic critical circle map with irrational rotation number. And then one thing that you can prove the following, so as I was saying, you have your domains, IN, IN plus one, let's focus on IN. You have IN, here you have your critical point, and you have the return map FQN plus one, right? And now what we want is to look backwards this return map. So we will take FQN plus one of IN, and we will pull it back until it comes back. So one thing that we will do is actually not pull it back until the critical point, we will stop in the critical value, okay? So we will pull back, Q1 plus one minus one times. Why? Because the last inverse branch, we already know, it behaves as a cube root, right? So we don't care about that. The problem is here because we have a long chain of positions of little pieces of our critical circle map F. 
and the, when I say alone, I mean QN plus one minus one uh, iterates. So, and these numbers grow exponentially fast, as we know. So, this is the part that we have to take care of. After that, if you know how to deal with this uh, return map until the critical value, then it's just one iterate. Uh, with, it will behave as a cube root, so it, it is well controlled. So again, in the real line, these inverse branches, we already understand them, but then now we want to understand what happens in the complex plane close to the real domains. So we will take a Poincaré disk around FQN plus one of IN, and we want to pull it back, okay? And what the almost Schwarz inclusion say is that there will be some loss of angle because you have no Epstein maps anymore. You just have analytic maps. We don't know the size, of the domain of holomorphicity. But it will say that uh, if you go to deeper and deeper levels of renormalization, the loss of angles goes to zero. Or to put it in another way, so you have a Poincaré disk of angle theta, it will, and you and you pull it back, it will be mapped inside a Poincaré disk of angle theta divided by Kn. And Kn goes to one as n goes to infinity. So you are almost no divided by anything. Okay? This is an application of the almost source inclusion to this, to the context of critical circuit map. And uh, this lemma, uh, the statement is just the same as in the book. It is not difficult to prove this. It's kind of a straightforward consequence of the almost first inclusion. Because precisely, these Poincaré disks are getting smaller and smaller, right? Because the, the intervals of renormalization are getting smaller and smaller. So the error that you have, the loss of angle, is going to zero. OK? And then this means something in terms of points. So now I can think about points in the Poincaré disk and trying to, to keep track of these points in the complex plane, inside the po this little Poincaré disk, but in the complex plane. So a first consequence of this lemma is the following. So as you, I hope you remember, it, it, we define in the book these domains, DM. So DMs are just Euclidean disks. They have the critical point more or less in the middle because of the real bounds, the critical point is, is not too close to any of the two boundaries. And then for points in these domains, we will try to keep track of the return. And the lemma is uh, the following. So you are able to control this ratio, which is uh, the diameter of these domains divided by the length of the interval where you are pulling back, OK? So the lemma says that if you take FQM back to F of IN, this is, uh, let me see, it's OK, here, uh, univalent. And moreover, you have this control on this ratio, this geometric control uh, on the ratio between the diameter of these guys and the length of the intervals of the real intervals, OK? So this lemma uh, is a consequence, kind of a straightforward consequence of the previous one. And then, you see this lemma is controlling what I was saying, the return, the inverse branch until the critical value. So with these things, you are able to try to prove the complex bounds. So let me, just to finish, I think I'm talking too much today, uh, to prove the complex bounds. So let me recall some things that uh, we wrote on the book. The idea is to prove an estimate like this. What you want to prove is that you are close we are just fixing the critical point at the origin, and that you have a neighborhood where you behave, where you expand uh, more than uh, z to the power of three, okay? Remember that three comes from the criticality. We are assuming critical points, otherwise, otherwise, so you will have a number five or whatever. Okay? So this estimate is what you want to prove. Because if this is true, as this is written here, it means that the inverse branches behave as cube roots. And then you will have what we want, that the, the domains of eta and psi, they will be compactly contained and well within contained inside the codomain. And then this will give you the, the bound for the modulus. So the main technical point is to prove an estimate like this, okay? 
And then, as I was saying, okay, I want to take the, the inverse branches, the, the return maps, but uh, looking backwards, and I want to prove that they behave like cube roots. I know that the last one, it certainly behaved like a cube root. So from the critical value to the critical point, it is what it is. We have non-flat critical points, means exactly that. And in fact, we are in the real analytics setting here. So it is certainly in some conformal coordinates. It is exactly, you can write it exactly as a cube root. So the idea is to control the, the backward iterates until the critical value, as I was explaining, and to prove that they are not uh, bad behave. And this is contained in the following proposition. Uh, well, again, as I was saying, uh, we consider this disk uh, BM. And, uh, and what you have is the following. So here is the estimate. The idea is that the, you are measuring, you have a point in the complex domain, and you are taking these backward iterates, and there is always a distance between this point and the real interval, the one dimensional dynamical interval right and you consider the ratio which is the distance to this one dimensional interval divided by the length of this interval okay and what you can prove is that this ratio behaves almost linearly not linearly but is bounded by a linear behavior so to, to be more precise you have here on the right a linear behavior you have constants b1 and b2 and precisely what the proposition is saying is that there exists this constant, B1 and B2, such that you have this. So you have this uh, disk, uh, Dm, here in the interval Qr plus 1. You go back, you go back, you go back until the critical value. And what you have is that this relation, uh, this ratio, uh, is dominated by a linear behavior. Uh, and, and this is it, because after that, which is very well behaved, you have this cube root. And then in terms of size, what you know is that these guys, they, they, they will be well within contained, compactly contained, but well within contained in the, in the original domain. Of course, you need to be much more careful. I'm not giving the details here. I'm not even close to do it, but you need to control carefully. You want to construct uh, the holomorphic commuting pair with all the conditions and uh, I mean, the part of the modulus is not so difficult. The, the, the part that you have to be careful is when you construct the domains of holomorphicity that you want to consider. So these return maps are analytic, so they have holomorphic extension. But again, you want to choose suitable domains where you will restrict this holomorphic extension. Of course, I'm skipping a lot of details here, but this is the idea. You control the geometry of these return maps until the critical value, and then you are done. As you can see, I'm not saying anything about the dynamics of these uh, return maps, because as I was saying at the beginning, uh, holomorphic commuting parts have very complicated dynamics. They have positive topological entropy. We are not entering there. We just control the geometry. And again, since you are in the holomorphic world, uh, this geometrical control usually gives you pre-compactness uh, via Montel theorem. And this is part of the magical thing about uh, complex analysis, right? Why complex analysis is so useful in dynamics? Well, part of it, at least uh, for re the renormalization viewpoint, is that it gives it gives you uh, pre-compactness, right? So if you have some bound on the geometry, on the extension of some domains or some ranges, it's not so difficult to prove uh, that you have what in complex analysis usually is called a normal family, right? A normal family means a pre-compact family, and this is a part of the difficulty, of the main difficulties of uh, renormalization due to the fact that you are iterating uh, on an infinite dimensional space. So, okay, I, I think I, I've been talking too much. I'm sorry. I hope you are still there. After 10 hours of lectures, <laughs> I hope you, you are enjoying uh, all these uh, things and notions that for us are very nice. So I will stop here. Thank you very much for your presence and for your attention.